Hello, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for being here. As uh, participants continue to come into the room, we'll just let you in and come in and join the conversation. I'm Cynthia Ruffin. I am uh, the, the, and I want to welcome you all to the first of a speaker series here at Antioch University, sponsored by Colors and the LGBTQ. Uh, youth Counseling Services and the LGBTQ Specialization Antioch in Los Angeles. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm the director of the Colors Program, producing this series along with um, the LGBT Specialization. So I want to briefly tell you how this whole thing came about. So for those of you who don't know, Colors offers free and unlimited mental health services to young LGBTQ plus identified individuals under 25 and to their parents and, uh, uh, and their families and their partners. Now our work is about serving people who have been marginalized and have little access to services. Now we all know how challenging this year of pandemic and protests and political upheaval has been. And it's been all the more challenging for our young queer identified, our young gender non-conforming identified, and our young trans identified youth who've been quarantined at home. Now almost weekly, we've been hearing reports of vicious attacks against the trans community just two weeks ago. Actually, when I wrote this, it was just two weeks ago, but now I believe it's just two days ago, another trans woman was brutally attacked here in Los Angeles. Now for this panel, we are gonna be centering on trans resilience trans strength and trans action. In fact, this panel is a call to action. And I hope that every one of you here will understand after this ways that you can stand up and step in with us. So welcome to this brave space. I am the guardian of this space and I have some housekeeping notes for you. So first is all of your microphones are on mute, on, on mute, on mute. All your microphones are on mute. Now, if need be, I can unmute you to ask a question, for example. Other than that, your microphones will stay muted for the duration. So it's the best way to not get distracted. Some few times people walk away and forget their, their, their microphones on still, and we can hear everything that's going on. So it's just so we can stay focused on, on, on the conversation that's going to be happening. So there, Q&A. So now at the bottom of your screen, you'll see there are two things. One is a chat box where you can put things into the other things Q&A. So if you have questions, please type your questions right in there. I'll be monitoring uh, that box. And when we stop for questions, I will go through them. Sequoia, my dear friend Sequoia is here. She will monitor the chats. So if anyone wants to post a resource they know about or they want to give a thumbs up or a, a, a high five or anything like that, that is the place for that. This panel will run approximately 50 minutes and there will be 20 minutes for question. This panel is being recorded so you can access it on our Antioch University YouTube YouTube channel and you'll also be able to access it on the Colors website about a month from now. We've got a brand new website coming up so look out for it. It'll be coming a month from now. I just have a couple of thanks that uh, I'd like to give before I hand the mic off to uh, to Dr. Jackson. I would like to thank you first of all to all of our panelists who are here this evening. I'm, I'm sure Tanika might, might have a thanks, uh, Dr. Jackson will have a thanks and, and Jesse as well. Thank you for being here, taking your time to be here with us and, uh, and, and tell us about the, the fabulousness that you're bringing to the world. We'd love to hear about it. I also want to thank Antioch University for hosting, uh, for hosting this this evening. I want to thank uh, Mark Howard, Provost at Antioch in the Office of the Provost very much for doing this. I want to talk, uh, thank Dr. Tanika Jackson and the LGBT Specialization for co-sponsoring this event with us um, this, uh, this evening. And behind the scenes, I want to thank Harold Hale, who is our IT maestro, who is uh, keeping us moving forward and making sure that we don't have any issues this evening. And uh, Sequoia Thompson, who is here volunteering and, uh, and monitoring our chat for us this evening. So with that said, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tanika Jackson, our new director of LGBTQ specialization at Antioch Union Clinical Psychology at Antioch University, who will uh, say hello and go over our participant agreements. Have a wonderful time and I will be back at the end of, uh, at the, end of the show. Thank you, Cynthia. Hello, everyone. Hello. As Cynthia stated, my name is Dr. J Jackson. I am the new director of the LGBT specialization at Antioch University, LA. My pronouns are also she and her. 
The specialization is in the business of training students to effectively work with LGBT clients in the community. We have partnered with Colors to give the students the unique, and I would say necessary, opportunity to gain training at counseling centers specifically servicing the LGBT community. Antioch and Colors are charged with bringing awareness to and educating others about the lives of LGBTQ identified individuals. So the panel's discussion today is just one example of that profound work. I am honored and excited to be a part of it. Of course, as always, Cynthia did a great job thanking everyone. And I just want to reiterate that you do not know how much we appreciate your help, your time, and your commitment to this work. So I want to thank you again for taking the time to be with us and, and engage in this conversation today. So let's get started. First of all, I want to encourage you, bring your whole self into this space. Bring your whole self. This is one time that we want you to feel seen and appreciated, okay? Listen with your eyes, your ears, and your heart. Listen to understand, okay? We want you to know that this is a brave space. Um, safe space is connected to comfort, right? So in, in, in opposite of that, a brave space requires you to, to be courageous, right? And lean into discomfort. So lean into compassion today during this panel. Be courageous in what you say and how we hear this information today. So again, welcome, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Hi, well, I'm going to, uh, I guess, introduce myself. <laughs> My name is uh, Jesse Jacobson, and uh, I was the first trans uh, student to graduate from the master's degree with uh, clinical psychology. I went on to be the first uh, trans therapist at the LA Gay and Lesbian Center, which is happily now the LGBT center. Uh, and I've worked as a therapist uh, and as a lecturer. I'm also a musician and I'll be hosting tonight. And, and I'm just so excited about being here and, be, and this event. Uh, we have some great guests and I'm gonna introduce uh, them all to you. But first I just wanna say as an Antioch graduate, adjunct professor and colors board member. It's fair to say I have a strong attachment to the school, the LGBT plus specialization and colors counseling services, and its focuses on uh, LGBTQ plus youth. Antioch's dedication to social justice, diversity and progressive innovation is so important to me as a trans woman. And I'm so thrilled to have this opportunity to host this event featuring a panel of inspirational and talented activists, designers, models, artist and, and business person who identify as trans or non-binary. In my years as a therapist at the LA LGBT Center, then the Gay and Lesbian Center, working with a diverse population, I was forced to confront my own unearned white privilege on a daily basis. And this is true again during this time of protests, pandemic and presidential politics when powerful uplifting Black Lives Matters and Black Trans Lives Matter Protests are violently opposed by a president and party that actively court white supremacists and has been dubbed the discrimination administration for its almost monthly political ass assaults on trans rights, as well as anti-LGBTQ plus rhetoric. At a time when both major parties oppose Medicare for all during a pandemic and refuse to address the systemic racism and violence of the police against people of color, it is an honor to be able to discuss trans non-binary activism and resilience with our four panelists. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce them. Bambi Salcedo is a national and international recognized transgender Latina woman and is the president and CEO of the Trans Latin Co Latina Coalition, a national organization that focuses on addressing the issues of transgender Latinas in the US. Bambi also developed the Center for Violence Prevention and transgender wellness, a multi-purpose, multi-surface space for trans people in Los Angeles. Her activist public speaking has ranged from testifying to governmental bodies, human rights and social justice organizations, universities and colleges, at demonstrations and rallies, and national and international conferences with a focus on transgender related issues, social justice, healthcare, social services, incarceration, immigration and detention, 
as well as professional and economic development for transgender people. Bambi has been invited to participate in several panels at the White House, including in 2016, the United States of Women, where she shared the stage with Vice President Biden at the opening plenary session. And in 2015, Transgender Women of Color and Violence and LGBTQ plus People of Color Summit. Bambi has also participated as the opening plenary speaker at several conferences, including the 2015 National HIV Prevention Conference, the United States Conference on AIDS in 2009 and 2012. She has participated as facilitator with the Pan American Health Organization while developing the blueprint on how to provide competent healthcare services for transgender people, as well as healthcare for LGBT people and human rights in Latin America and the Caribbean and is receiving a special recognition award at the Hispanicized Summit tomorrow. Woo. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Lucky Alexander, the founder of Invisible Men, is a trans man who is an advocate of exacting change that builds bridges within the LGBTQI community and creates resources and support around trans masculine folks and trans parents. He is a member of Los Angeles County Transgender Advisory Council the CHIPTS CAB member, HIV commissioner, and a proud member and historian of the Brown Boy Project, director of workforce development at Trans Can Work, and the designer of the All Lives Matter art installation on Hollywood Boulevard, which many of you may have seen. He received the title of Mr. Quest 2018, a community advocacy award with APAT. He was the assistant strategy director for the historic 2019 National Trans Visibility March and has received the Lou Sullivan Award for the work he does centered around trans masculine individuals in the HIV AIDS arena. Lucky has a passion for gender and social justice and is very committed to giving back to the community through education, training, and awareness. He also provides healing by creating fun wherever he goes and teaching mixed media art and computer technology. His experience spans 18 years in capacities such as SGA leadership in Utah, a homeless shelter program manager, peer mentor for homeless LGBTQI youth in Las Vegas, Nevada, and LA, California. He has also done speaking engagements, expressing his story of trans masculine experience, and facilitated cultural humility training for LA homeless housing facilities. He also holds degrees in computer science, math and culinary arts, and is currently working towards a BA in psychology. Lucky is a dedicated member of the community and a father raising four children to be open-minded, free thinkers, and lovers of gummy bears. I love that. Dominique Silver is an international model signed with Slay Model Management, the world's first trans-exclusive model agency based in Los Angeles and New York. Dominique has graced the catwalks of Marco Marco, Garo Sparrow, Max Sarefa, Oxford Fashion Studio, Richie Rich, Kyle Richards. Her commercial work includes the New York State Department of Health, Hydrofacial, Planned Parenthood, Model Alliance, and Models.com alongside Beverly Peel and Veronica Webb, along with other fashion notables. She has also appeared on Netflix's hit, sorry, Netflix's hit Next in Fashion and Ryan Murphy's Pose on FX. Yay. <laughs> Dexter Simmons is an American fashion designer born in Oakland, California, who studied at FIDM San Francisco, where he developed his pension for the bold and fantastical. He first gained mainstream recognition when competing on Rihanna's Styled to Rock, where he worked with artists such as Rihanna, Neo, Nervo, Kylie Minogue, uh, Miley Cyrus, and Pharrell Williams. Dexter and his designs have been featured in various fashion magazines like Glamour, Content, and Huffington Post. Marie Claire has called Dexter Fashion's Triple Threat a designer, stylist, and makeup artist. Dexter competed on Project Runway's 15th season, where he got a chance to expose his innovative aesthetic to the world. Since then, Dexter has been taking fashion weeks and music videos by storm. Okay, let's jump into the questions. I mean, what a group, okay. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to ask each of you, how have you been during this past year? How have you dealt with the pandemic and being in, in quarantine? Uh, I'll start with you, Lucky. Um, you know, it's interesting. While we've had the, the pandemic and we have quarantine and all of these things, um, 2020 has been a pretty good year for me. Um, 
with the exception of not being able to leave the house. Um, I think that uh, most of quarantine, you know, like you get used to this whole Zoom thing, you get used to like um, interacting with people via a screen, but um, I feel like I've gotten a lot of work done because I've been like, I didn't have anything else better to do. So it's it's actually not been too bad. I mean, um, you know, I, I worry about my community and I worry about uh, all those other folks that maybe don't have the same level of comfortability. But um, I think being left to, to be in the house and you have to stay in the house, um, I've been okay with it, personally. So it sounds you, like you've just made the best of it. And, and right. Moved right. on with things and actually worked it to your advantage, which is, is fantastic. Pretty much. Bambi, how about you? How have you been this year? And, um, yeah, how are you dealing with it all? Yeah, well, primero que nada, quiero darle gracias a mi poder superior por darme la oportunidad de estar aquí con ustedes y honrar la presencia de todas las personas que nos acompañan. I know that it was probably hard for some of you to understand what I just said, but it is a um, customary thing that I acknowledge my creator, my higher power for giving me the opportunity to breathe one more day. Um, but also I want to honor and acknowledge the beautiful and amazing people who are joining us today. And also, you know, express my gratitude for the invitation to share space with such amazing and beautiful uh, people. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I, I think what I have to say uh, related to your question, um, personally, there has, at least up in the last month, there has been, you know, tragedy uh, on a personal level. Um, but I think throughout this pandemic, um, there have also been um, like personal um, things that I have been challenged with, right? Um, that have obviously allowed me to grow as an individual uh, and, but also, you know, thinking of ways how to support members of our community, right? Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> I mean, you know, through, because of this pandemic, um, you know, we decided that as an organization, we needed to continue to have our doors open even if it was just to provide food to our people because um, many members of our community don't have access to, to food, right? Um, and the fact that we provide, you know, hot meals, uh, at least one hot meal every day, um, it's one hot meal that members of our community will have for one day. Um, and so, you know, this year has been Personally, um, super challenging, but also has been a year to find ways for me to continue to be um, resilient and also to figure out what are my personal needs in terms, you know, for me to take care of myself uh, while at the same time understanding my responsibility uh, that I have with not just the people who work at our organization, but also for people who access services to our organization and making sure that as a newly starting organization, right, that we continue to keep our doors open and that I continue to um, to hustle, right, uh, money for, for our peoples. And, you know, have been doing that and, you know, we are projecting that by the end of this year, we have, uh, you know, we have been distributing uh, about a quarter of a million dollars to our community in support. You know, we're supporting people with rental assistance and food cards and, you know, whatever we can. Um, so, so that's, you know, I, I have no time for, for me to to reminisce on, you know, how so uh, on, in sorrow, to be honest with you. I, I think it's, for me, a way to continue to push and for me to continue to find ways to support our peoples. Well, it, it's so important that you touch on all the economic ramifications of, of the lockdown, of the pandemic, and, and of everything else. And, and we'll get more into detail on that um, as we go. Uh, Dexter, how about you? Are you muted? Can you unmute? 
Oops. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to just send extra message. Is that, can you hear me now? Is that better? Yes, we, yes now we can hear okay. you. Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, I guess most of the year has been a little weird. Like, I don't want to say it's been a great year. I feel like a lot of people who are probably watching this have had a rough year. They've had to move, they've lost things. Um, I've definitely tried to make the best of it though. Most of the year I have been, or most of the last six months, I've been making masks for people, uh, donating them mostly to paramedics. And like my, I have a lot of friends on Instagram that are paramedics. So I did a paramedic call out and then each of their little teams, I sent them these really funny masks and like, it's just been going, it went from like a couple hundred to a couple thousand. So most of the time I've been sitting at my house, cutting out every bit of scrap material that's been donated to me, turning my donations in and just kind of giving them to people. Yeah. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I hope you don't mind my mentioning that you told me earlier that you're literally going out and giving them to people, you know, homeless people on the streets. And I think that's just amazing. And, and that's the sort of thing that, that there's your resilience. I mean, that's what we're all talking about. Yeah, it's weird. It's so loaded. I think the moment that I get in front of a camera and I can tell a lot of people about it, my brain just goes, oh, it's fine. You already did it. And it's like, it's hard for me to, you know, to talk about the things I do for a good reason, because I feel like there's sort of this invisible magic, like you just do them. And, um, but yeah, no, it's been interesting. I, San Francisco is a weird place to give things out to the home. It's, it's magical, but then every once in a while you have this crazy experience. So I went from like it being really fun to being a little scary, but I still kept going. Um, and I gave out like quite a few, some of them on Market Street, and then I did a lot of them in Oakland. Um, near me, there's people living under all the bridges here in like large, um, large groups. Um, so I tried to sort of leave piles of them on something kind of nice with like little like notes of affirmation. Just like little things, it's like I don't have a lot of money to give them, but at least I can sort of make them feel like they're important or they exist to me. Um, and yeah, being in quarantine, that has been weird. I was supposed to be in LA actually. Um, and then I had to come back here and kind of like lock myself down to this apartment and I haven't been able to travel. So uh, I've been just kind of driving my agent crazy, calling, calling CC every day, <laughs> asking him what's going on. But yeah, it's been, it's up and down. I think all of us are on up and down. I don't know if anyone's having a perfect pandemic. Probably not, probably not a perfect one. Well, maybe the uh, large pharmaceutical companies. Uh, Dom, will you check in with us, please? How are you doing? Hi, I want to thank you guys for having me and giving this wonderful, amazing opportunity as well. And the pandemic and the quarantine, as Dexter said, I'll follow, it's been very up and down. You know, I, I have spent a lot of time, um, you know, quarantine, which I'm a very social person, so that was totally different to what I'm used to. And it, it, I had, in the beginning, I, it took me like a couple, a month or two to accept it. You know, I was like fighting it and I wanted to go out, but you know, everything was closed and I had panic attacks like every other day because I was thinking that I was at home with my mother who's at high risk for COVID and I, I didn't want to give it to her and it like really stressed me out. So I ended up like finding peace with like meditation and like working out and strengthening my mind. And I just honestly like gave everything to God and, and made sure that every there it was out of my control so i didn't drive myself crazy and i traveled a lot which is really weird because uh, i know you weren't supposed to travel but i traveled like three or four times during the pandemic which was crazy because as a avid traveler i'm not used to being in airports with no one like and everything was like shut off like you had to walk like 20 minutes to get to your plane because you know no stores are open and it was really surreal to be honest, and I'm, I'm glad that I came out a bit stronger now. And actually I'm like been really busy lately since after things like worked out. And I'm really happy that I got this time to just sit and discover myself and get to therapy and, and find time to just be with myself because I was always out and about and giving everything that I had to everyone else and then I'd never kept anything for myself. So I'm glad that the pandemic happened because it gave a lot of time for me to focus on myself and my issues and my traumas and get therapy and work with relationships that I haven't worked with that I didn't really have time to work with. And so now I'm like, you know, back and working and working on my therapy and working on my issues and 
I'm really kind of grateful for a pandemic, you know, because if not, I wouldn't have time. I would keep going in this vicious cycle and I probably would not be in the place that I'm at now. Well, it, it sounds like everybody's kind of finding some silver lining in there. Yeah, and, and, and as you've all said, it's going to be extremely up and down. And I'm glad you mentioned the, the panic attacks, because even people who don't know what a panic attack is and have never had one before are having them during this lockdown, because it, it is a, a difficult time. And, and uh, so it's a panic attack is something we think somebody else has, but we can all have that. And, and it's a very frightening experience because you don't know what's happening unless you've had one before and then maybe you'll have some idea. So I, this leads me to the next question is, what is it that's allowed you to be resilient? You mentioned God and, and, and you've mentioned just finding some, some hope in it, but uh, where, where else do you find your strength? You know, how, how do you keep it going? I usually pull it from like my family, my close friends. I have a really good support system of people around me that I reach out. I'm learning to reach out more because as like a individual, I never really reached out to people for help. And so now I, I have a great amount of friends that I've known for years. I have an amazing agent and now I have a therapist and my family and I just take, you know, I, I, use that to power me and the days that I'm down I'll just surround myself with positivity I will work out and get my my endorphins up and I just do a lot of meditation actually like and and just focusing my brain on the positive things and manifesting good things instead of focusing on the bad and what's the worst that can happen personally that's great uh, Bambi, you've told us of so many things you're doing for other people. What is it within you that allows you to be so resilient and where do you find your strength? Um, so, you know, there's obviously, you know, the work that I do and many members of our community who are immersed in community uh, do, it's, it's super taxing in our bodies and our mind and, and our strength, to be honest with you. Um, but I have learned, you know, I mean, I've been in, I've been doing community work, you know, for over 20 years, um, nonstop. And um, I've learned probably, you know, I have been practicing over the, I would say the last 10 years or so um, to find some time for myself twice a year and seclude myself and write and um, connect with my creator. Um, but, you know, also what helps me is to really have that personal connection uh, with my creator, with, um, with nature, you know. Um, I just turned 51 on Monday and, um, you know, I, I went to the beach and I had Olympia uh, as the sun was setting and, you know, set my intentions and all of that. So all of those things, like um, I'm a super spiritual person and that helps me, for me to, um, you know, to continue going, you know, um, one of the first things that I do every, you know, when I wake up every single day is that I drink water, you know, and as I'm ingesting the water, I ask my higher power to um, to just guide me and help me to continue to be humble and to continue to uh, support to be um, a support of those who may need me. Um, but also, um, I, you know, I, I obviously have done a lot of healing, you know, um, to heal from my, the horrible experiences that I, I went through, um, you know, and so, you know, that has definitely helped me and, you know, just writing and, you know, I, I went to school and, you know, like all of those things have helped me for me to continue to grow and to continue to be center. Um, but, you know, also, you know, like I became vegan uh, almost four years ago. So, 
that's a consistent thing that I'm doing. I also go hiking at least three times a week. Um, so, you know, like all of those things help me for me to continue to be healthy and continue to be center and, um, you know, um, yeah, those things help me so much. I mean, it's, it's great to talk about those things in terms of specifics because it can be really helpful to people who are, who are uh, attending and, and uh, it's good to hear how everybody does this in a different way. Dexter, how do you do it? What, what keeps you resilient? Where does your strength come from? Um, I think it's mostly, it's like a 50-50 for me. It's being able, um, being with SLAY gives me a really good chance to sort of um, work in my community more and just like being a non-binary person, it's a little bit different because you sort of end up in this in-between space. So I think finding a place where you can, you can really like fight for your community, fight for the girls, fight for the boys. And like, um, that's really where I find it. I think just meeting them and learning their stories just because I think all of us have a story, especially in this community. And um, I think it's really important to have a place to sort of like find community there. And that's really where I get a lot of my resilience. If it's not there, I find it in a sewing machine. <laughs> is it easy for you to take care of yourself? To, do you forget to sometimes? Or is it always something that you, you can tap into easily? I'm an only child um, and I'm adopted. So I think I've always been a little bit more on my own. And I've always been about this queer. So we're talking like... I think everywhere I went with my mom when I was little, people would ask my mom like, oh my God, your daughter's so pretty. And I'd, be, and I'd be like, I'm a boy. And I'd be really upset about it. But then as I got older, I just kind of realized like that anomaly space was something that I needed to live in and get very comfortable with. And um, yeah, I think honestly, I, I get most of that. I get most of that through helping my community, like building fashion shows um, and then being able to pick out all the girls that people don't get to see. So visibility helps instead of it just being such a conversation all the time or me holding a sign and walking up and down the street. I think sometimes me making, because my, because of who I am, even my career is very mainstream. So my audience is very Midwest. So the Midwest people seeing my shows and seeing trans people for the first time, it's not, it's not like I'm uh, marching the Capitol, but those small wins are how they make sure they understand the world people. And I think that is so important to me. Yeah, it was interesting watching footage from your shows because it was just such a diverse group of people. And I think that's so amazing that those people are coming into people's homes through your work and, and through everybody's work here too. And, and uh, I, just, I just really admire and respect that. Lucky, how about you? Resilience, um, yeah. You know, I think for me, um, this pandemic um, has shown me how to, how to shift my perception right and and change what i'm looking at um like dominique i do a lot of meditating and you know i started meditating about um maybe five years ago where you know i really found it effective and so i think through this pandemic um meditation has been one of the things that has allowed me to shift what i'm looking at because you know just like everyone else here i've been through the same pandemic and um i see it differently because of what i'm looking at right and so um my kids are one of the, the great pools of, of strength that I draw from. And then um, just recently I got married um, in July. And so my wife has been one of those, um, she's been like an extra boost, you know, because even her through this pandemic, like we've, we've both dealt with um, very close calls um, when it comes to COVID. And we've had folks that have been close to us that, um, have either caught COVID or may have passed, right? Um, so I think just being able to draw strength from each other and um, be able to, to change what our perception looks like and change what, what we're looking at, right? Um, and so like throughout the pandemic, like I've been able to get a lot of work done and I'm like, well, if I can't go anywhere, one, I can't spend any money, two, you know, I'm looking and trying to find all of the upsides, right? Find all of the the silver linings and all of the gummy bears that are in this this equation, right? Um, because I'm like, yo, like if I don't have anywhere to go and you know we're all stuck here, then let me build. And so like building for my community and building out um, not only my organization, but you know, like trying to help other organizations that are coming up and like really kind of lend that and being able to like um, still 
be in so many different places and be at different conferences and be in, in different spaces all at the same time, um, I think is also what COVID has given us, right? And we're all able to to interact still and travel sort of, you know, I just travel from one room to my computer, but it's, it's you know, it's one less plane ticket, but still being able to, um, to deal with and, and engage with community um, has been definitely one of the upsides to this. Well, yeah, and you touch on another aspect is that, is that uh, you know, those of us who have significant others that live with us or, or children or families are going to be affected in, in very different ways. Uh, certainly, we've talked, um, I think Cynthia talked in her introduction about the uh, trans kids, LGBTQ kids who are stuck in situations where they can't leave their home in families that are not necessarily accepting. And, and uh, that is just such a major issue, including, you know, you know, abuse and and, uh, and neglect. And, and I think those are uh, the sort of people that, that, that we hope to reach out and, and give a message to. And, and, you know, having all of you talk about the ways in which you deal with these stressors is really so helpful. Um, I'd love you and, and all of you feel free to ask each other questions or whatever you want. I, I just love also to, to talk about your activism and organizing work in and for the trans community. Um, you know, how, how you got to that place and, and what it is that's most essential for you in that. And, and any one of you, anyone who wants to answer that, feel free. I can say that I fell into it accidentally because, you know, I was watching like all of everything that was going on and what happened and to me personally, like a lot of my friends started to reach out to me and ask me if I was okay. And I honestly got like, kind of tired of telling everybody like, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. And I, I appreciated that they, they're inquisitive about it. So I just decided on my own to just broadcast a message, like a public service announcement to people since I have like a good name and a lot of respect in my community to let people know like, you know, I'm, I am affected. You know, I've been dealing with this for my whole life. Like, you know, the issues of race, et cetera. And, I wanted them to put a face to a name of a horrible thing and, you know, to show them that I, I am okay, but, you know, I'm still affected. So I kind of fell into it, not accidentally, but then once I got in it and, and I, I thought about it and since I have so many good respect, so I had a lot of respect, I ended up just doing it and being a Black trans in this in this world now is like the, you know, it's very difficult. And I used to, you know, I, I didn't really like want to accept the challenges and all the racism that was happened. So I just, I, I just spit the bullet in and I just said, hey, like, hey, I'm a, I've been a victim of racism my whole life. Like, this is what racism looks like. This is a person that suffers from racism. And, you know, I, it's, you, it's someone that you know. It's not like, oh, the, oh, this happened to that person and I don't know them, but no, it's someone that you know. And I, I can always put a good face and smile and laugh, but it affects me. But I am okay, but I'm working on it. So then it just like snowballed and I, I felt like people started to get behind me and give me forces and, and public podcast my public service announcement. And it gave me like strength and to give back to my community because I've always wanted to give back to my community and I didn't really know how. And with this, I found my place and I felt content and full with being um, an activist. And that's how I started my activism, mostly online and signing petitions and bringing awareness to issues that people think are not so close to home, but they're close to home, closer than you think. That's great. Dexter, you know, it, it, people also talk about uh, conveying all these things like, like intersectionality, you know, the, where, where, where race, race and gender and, and ethnicity and, and religion and all those things come together. It seems like what you're doing in terms of fashion is you're presenting, letting us know about all of that, you know, in an artistic sense. Does that, do you feel that way? Yeah, it's, it's like a, it's like a sip and see for the, for like adults, I guess. Cause like those people don't, those people don't know what a trans person looks like. They're, they don't understand non-binary. That's the whole thing that I've been working on with the people that I want to say they're my demographic, even though they're not my demographic, but the people who really follow me, they don't really understand. And they thought 
I was a little bit weird and interesting and they fell in love with that. So now they're sort of getting a little piece of these new people. And like, I think it's more for me about the, that visibility is almost just as important as, because I don't know what it is. It's like the, the way to protest has become so different. My fashion protest has always been secretly talking to my agency about getting people into fashion week. And then once I could get CC and Slay to give me the models that I wanted for fashion week, then I had to fight with fashion week to get the girls in the shows because they're really weird about it. They're really weird about diversity in shows. And like, if you look at my shows, half the models that are in my shows aren't even from the agency that they allow me to use. I just show up with them and no one really challenges me. And that is my, my sign waving moment when I'm like, no, they're all staying girl walking, no. And then it's just like, that's just what keeps happening every season. It's like, now people know my shows. And so <clears throat> they just get out of my way and let me book whoever the hell I want. Like they don't, they don't ask me any questions. Well, and I think that's what, what, what you're all getting, getting to do, Bambi. I think you're also, you know, you're breaking down barriers. You're, 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 you're saying that, you know, this may be what the status quo was in the past, but we're not accepting that anymore. And, and I know you've done so much work in that area. I don't do shows without trans, without trans visibility or non-binary visibility. I've never done a show without it in my entire career. I just don't talk about it until now. So like 10 years of making clothes, this is probably one of the first conversations I've had about it because I like to kind of be silent about it and just let it happen. Like, why does it, it doesn't need to be, um, I don't want to get any stars for it. I just want people to see it. I want people to see my work and I want them to see my friends. That's fantastic. Bambi, how about you? I mean, I know you've broken so many barriers and, and, and I think that, you know, it, the intersectionality is, is, they should name it after you. Oh, well, you know, I, I always say that I, I am an intersection walking, right? Um, I am a mujer, trans, Latina, immigrante, you know, ex-convict, uh, person in recovery, living with HIV. Uh, I mean, you know, a sexual assault survivor, both in prison and on the streets, sex work, you know, um, right? Like I bring my experiences as who I am um, everywhere I go. But, you know, the, the truth is that, you know, the way I have learned to do the work that I do and that we do as an organization, it really is to understand um, the changes that need to happen within our society for us to be able to change the structures that continue to marginalize us. And I know that when we are able to not just build the infrastructure um, that needs to be built within our community um, and really demanding an intentional investment in trans lives and build and support trans leadership, whether it's in fashion, whether it's in filming, whether it's in the arts or any kind, um, or, you know, simply, you know, founding an organization, right? Um, and be able to support the leadership of trans people. Um, and so we know that that when we are able to build our political and economic power, then we are going to be able to transform the trans movement. And we are doing that. The Trans Latino Coalition has been influential in really building the trans movement, right? Like we have an integral part of the trans movement nationally. And I'm going to even say, you know, in other parts of the world as well. Um, and so, you know, for instance, here in California, you know, we made history just not long ago with Senate Bill, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, Assembly Bill uh, 2218, which is the uh, Transgender Health and Equity Fund, which for the first time in the state of California, there is a fund that will support trans people across the state, right? That will also support trans -led organizations that will also support trans uh, organizations that support trans lives, right? That at least 75% of the services that are provided to um, are trans people, right? And so, you know, so for we learned that for the first time in the history of the state of California also, um, there has never been a bill that was introduced, crafted, 
organized and pushed all the way through the governor's desk um, until 2020. And those efforts were led by the Trans Latino Coalition, in which obviously we built a coalition uh, across the state um, of translated organizations. And you know, we know that despite the opposition, um, you know, and despite the fact that every single time our our bill was in committee, where we told that our bill was going to die. Um, you know, we made it all the way through and it was signed. Um, but also, you know, Senate Bill 132, right, which is the Respect Agency and Dignity Act, which will also give the, uh, the agency to trans people who are incarcerated in the state of in the state of California to be able to choose where they will do their sentences, where they will feel more safe, you know, and so for us as an organization, you know, we look at not just supporting and building the individual, right, and supporting the leadership development of the individual, but also supporting the infrastructure development that needs to happen in our community. And we have been very vocal and visible and unapologetic and some people think radical and that's okay because that's what we have to do. Um, and you know, we're not afraid to be visible, right? Uh, and despite the work that we do as an organization, you know, our community continues to be murdered and attacked, right? Um, I mean, a perfect example, right? Like a week, a week and three days ago, one of our volunteers was brutally attacked and she was stabbed 16 times and her throat was sl sliced. Um, and so she's, you know, recovering, but but these are the our realities. And for us, you know, the way we do the work, it's, you know, like our lives are on the line every single day, right? And so, like, whatever, you know, people can think of whatever they want to think about us, about our organization, but what is most important to us is really to support our peoples. Wow, I mean, it, it's remarkable all the things that that you've achieved, you know, and and it's just it's transforming, you know, the conversation around everything, but it's actually transforming things on the ground. Uh, Lucky, in terms of all that, we we're talking about the intersectionality and 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 how has your particular intersectionalities impacted your life and career and community, family, activism, whichever any of those you want to discuss. Well. Um when it comes to like the work that i do within community i'm very intentional about making sure that there's visibility around the trans masculine narratives um but it wasn't that we wanted to to say hey look the trans masculine narrative is here we wanted to give folks that autonomy to tell their own stories and so that's what um invisible men was here to do like we started invisible men about three years ago um with the the intention to be able to give that that power and and that um autonomy to other transmasculine individuals to be able to to tell their own stories like to be their own storytellers um instead of these narratives that are handed us around like what masculinity is supposed to look like or um how we're supposed to perform that masculinity right and so um with with invisible men we started out as just that so currently we're at uh 28 what we call legacies who are the folks that have you know stood up and say you know i want to be visible um so 28 of those legacies have told their stories but um what what happened after the first year was like we started to really gain a lot of visibility around the trans masculine like narrative and we said well you know at this point we could reach out to a lot of other organizations and be able to link in with those organizations that are already doing work and say hey look we'll train you and show you like what it looks like to um, engage with trans masculine folks because our narrative looks much different than maybe our non-binary siblings or our trans femme siblings. And so we wanted to make sure that um, all of those folks knew like what, what does that look like to walk our road? Even though each and every trans person is different when you talk to, to different trans folks, but for the trans masculine individual, there are unique challenges that we come into like uh, for example, going to an OBGYN, you know, office and you look like me, right? And, you know, I, I still have parts that need to be checked on um, in those particular offices. And because of all of the experiences that I had when I started to transition, 
and all of the lack of resources that were out there for trans masculine folks, um, I said, well, if they're not out here, let's create them. Let's figure out how to, how to find them. So for all of the uh, resources that we can't identify and find those folks that are willing to work with us, we just create our own. <laughs> So, you know, around like emotional support, there weren't very many spaces where trans masculine folks could be like, hey, look, I'm not feeling okay, especially around what masculinity looks like for uh, men of color, just whether you're trans or not, like there's no space to be able to say, hey, I'm not okay today and this is where I'm at, right? At least not safely um, without, you know, looking at it, folks looking at it as a weakness or looking at it as something to look down upon, right? Like we're people and we have emotions just the same as you know our feminine counterparts and so i wanted to create that space um, for trans masculine folks to be able to support one another and really have that support um, around like those mental health pieces and around all of those other pieces and and mentorship and all of that because um with respect to a lot of the research studies you know trans men are at the highest at the highest um rate of suicide and you know at 50 55 percent as opposed to like our general public is at like 14.9, 15%. And then even our, our non-binary counterparts um, are looking at something like 26%. And then we have our, our trans femme counterparts that are like 27, 29%. But trans masculine folks are at the highest rates of suicide. And that's ideology and or um, attempting suicide, right? And so I, I just wasn't about watching my community, my my respective community in particular, these trans masculine folks that, you know, I'm having communication with and engaging with and like I'm losing people left and right to suicide and no one's talking about it. No one's bringing those, those things to light. So I said, you know, like we need to support one another and we need to be here for one another. And um, so we created those spaces, the same with the HIV work that I do. Um, I had a best friend that, you know, he was 18 and found out that um, at 18, we found out that he was HIV positive. And of course, you know, 20 years ago, I was like, death sentence, right? And so I started really doing the research and here we are 20 years later and he's still my best friend, he's still with us. And um, as a masculine person, even though he was a, a, a gay masculine person, um, I wanted to make sure that that space was there, especially because trans men aren't really looked at um, when it comes to the HIV arena. And being that we are the most sexually um, diverse demographic uh, when it comes to all of the other different, you know, gender identities or, or sexual identities, like we're the most sexually diverse. When you look at the, the stats again, 90% um, of trans men or trans masculine folks out, identify outside of being straight. So whether it's pansexual, bisexual, or otherwise. And so if we're not being studied in HIV um, research and studies, and we are the most sexually diverse and we're sleeping with the, the quote unquote risk factors, um, then why aren't we being studied, right? So um, Invisible Men was mostly about like getting that visibility around like what is our narrative really? What are, what are let's debunk those myths around trans masculine folks that a lot of the world has. And so um, that was a lot of my motivation around building Invisible Men. And then, um, you know, there's a, a lot of different things that I do also in the community around policy, around um, a lot of a lot of different different things, um, policy, mental health, it's a lot. And then the All Black Lives Matter mural, they kind of brought a lot of that stuff to light because then people were kind of looking at me after that, like, "Hey, what do you do?" And so, like, then a lot of what Invisible Men does um, kind of was brought to more was given more visibility. Yeah, it seems like so much of the political discourse is around trans women, and and we of course hear of the murders, but the, but talking about suicide and in, in, in the trans masculine community is so essential, because it's it's it was it's, it's such a perfect name of your organization. It was hidden, and it was it is something that that even in in a lot of the organizations that 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 I've you know associated with or known, where where it seems so much less is known. So it's so important what you're doing. Thank you. And speaking of the politics, it, it's a scary time for for trans, non-binary, and and all of our brothers and sisters. Uh, you know how how do we cope with that? You know we've got an election in two weeks that is that is a really caustic cauldron of you know hatred and and anger and all that. You know contrasted with all these these amazing powerful protests. 
how, what, do you, what do you tell young people? What do you tell the people who are voting for the first time? It's, you know, it just seems like a, a terrifying time. Yeah, um, it's, you know, it's interesting because I have three adult children um, that are all of voting age. And so the only thing that I can tell them is to vote and that um, this is a right that, that you have and it needs to be exercised. And um, that this particular, this particular voting cycle and election cycle, um, really our lives are dependent on it. And literally as people of color, as trans people, as LGBTQ people, as people that are outside of your white Republican people, we're like our lives are in danger. So like vote, and I can't tell you who to vote for because that's, you know, vote for what makes sense. That's what I do ask uh, because some of what's going on with the current administration, like 99% of it doesn't make sense. So um, definitely I, I tell the younger generation, do your research, really look up and find out what these candidates are doing, find out um, what they support, find out what they don't, find out who they support, find out who's supporting them. Um, because all of those different factors will tell you a lot about, you know, who you should vote for. How about you, Dom? I mean, you know, how do you look at all this and with these with these politics going on? How involved are you? What does it mean to you? And what would you tell young people? Um, I try to like not get so involved because it kind of like stresses me out. And like, I know that it's something that in the end I can't control. But what I can do is like, guide people to pick the lesser of the two evils, you know, because I, I can't say that I support anyone 100%. And I try to like, you know, when the debates and stuff goes on and people like get into those conversations, I'm very non-confrontational. So I just kind of like sit in the corner and like, that's when I play dumb, when I'm not really dumb. So I, I luckily, I mean, I don't, not luckily, I just, I choose to have that way because I don't want to get into these debates about everyone, but I will encourage everyone to vote and I make sure like all my friends are registered to vote and I tell them, you know, this election means a lot to me as a black woman, as trans, you know, and um, as marginalized community, like this really means a lot and depends on who you vote, that's how we're going to stand in our relationship. So it's a very difficult situation. It's, I try to like, walk on it easily because I don't want to get upset but I know like a lot of people that have like stopped talking to people that they've known for a long time depending on who they're voting for and you know I'm, I'm not anyone to tell anyone what to do like I can just guide them in the right direction so that's how I feel about this the, the politics thing I, I, I watch what I need to watch I study and I take my stand and I just encourage everyone to vote because this vote, this election is very important to us as a marginalized community. Yeah, the, the discourse seems to have become so, so toxic that, that sometimes people won't even hear things that they might have heard before. I mean, it, it's hard to change somebody's mind or, or to, to influence somebody. How about for you, Dexter? That, honestly, I'm like very with Dominique on that one thing that she was explaining about like um, not really having a good option. I think as queer, non-binary, trans, inter and intersect intersect people, like I think we all have you have any has anybody ever found uh, two people that they liked in the entire time they've ever voted, or have you ever been too excited about both candidates? It's just, I think for us, it's it's sort of like a it's kind of sad. It's like a game. It's like just make sure we survive next year, and like that's how I've always thought about it since I was little. It's like oh my God, I just need to make sure I survive next year. Do these policies keep me alive? And how bad is this person? He's not that bad, fine. But we have this generation of people who are missing and voting and we're so busy saying, I'm this, I'm that, and you're out. And there's this little group in between that's so important. And those are the people who are pissed about both and don't want to be involved. And those are the people that I think are the most important to reach because they're like unhappy with both candidates, so they've opted out. And I, I just think it's so important, especially people in our community that feel that way. Like the, both of these people don't speak to me. This man isn't going to speak to me either. You know, and like these two older white men are never going to understand the issues of these like younger uh, people of color. Like I just, it's hard for a lot of my friends to get behind that. So I think my biggest thing is connecting with my friends and people that I know that are like, I don't even want to do this. And I'm like, yeah, but like, 
I don't want to die next year and I'm tired of going in bathrooms and being so scared to exist in there. I'm tired of like walking in. I just need them to see me as a person who also, I'm not like some protected person because I went on TV a couple of times. I mean, jack or shit when I'm walking around on a normal day and I'm meeting people like I'm also in danger. And I think if they can understand that these things affect me too, that I'm not, I'm not in some pink palace because I met a couple celebrities. Like I still do and deal with all the issues that the rest of you guys deal with. And I need you to see that I need you to vote in a way that keeps me alive. I don't really care too much about anything else, but being safe, staying alive and making sure that I can contact more people who are on the fence and maybe like put my personal, like, this is me. I've known you forever. Like I'm nervous about going places. I'm nervous in the grocery store because there's this nefarious look from people because everyone's mad about Black Lives Matter. So they see me and they see this black person and they think you're one of those Black Lives Matter people. And I was like, maybe, maybe not, you don't know. But I feel like I deal with all the same shit as everyone else. And the moment that I can get my fans, followers and people who are into my work to understand that like, I'm not gonna be around to keep putting out these lines if things keep going like this. Like I'm, it's real. Like I have a lot of girls that have been attacked this year. Like I've had it happen to me before. So um, I think humanizing all of our friends that are in our community to the people who just don't totally understand that like, no, this is me, me. Like I went to the store yesterday and I had to worry about walking out of it because it was unsafe. Bambi, how do you reach those people? I mean, how do you reach the people that won't even consider it, that won't see beyond their their blinders that are saying they're Republican or whoever they may be, or, or they, they just can't accept that anything could be possibly different for them? How do we reach them? It's existing in their space and just being there. It's not about getting them to follow some road. It's like, I <laughs> I like actually did a really big show with um, Slay Model Management in the Midwest. So they flew me to the Midwest to the Great Mall of America to do this show. And I was so scared because the whole time I was going to the plane, I'm calling my agent Cece and I'm going, girl, I'm really nervous. Like, I'm really scared to go to the Midwest. Like, am I safe? And like, those are the moments when like, I've explained that to my other friends and I've talked to them about it and they worry about me and it sort of like puts it in their head. It's like my, if you're out there and you're existing around your friends and you're just letting them know about those moments that you're not safe, I feel like it makes you more of a person to them and they realize that I'm not some faceless person on the internet that they saw being hurt or attacked one time. I'm your friend. Like I go places with you. Like we're close. And like, I literally can walk into a situation and work for Rihanna and walk out the next door and go into a bathroom and be scared for my life. Yeah. Like that, I think connecting them with that feeling is really important and making them understand that like, shit, nobody's safe. Do you still have that fear, Bambi, when your places or you know, places that aren't, aren't necessarily as accepting? Um, well, you know, I, um, so, Yes and no, right? I I am very fortunate and privileged and lucky that I have uh, been able to empower myself and that other people have empowered me. Um, so I I don't necessarily walk in fear, right? But I know that the threat is always there, right? Um, but nonetheless, I think uh, what is important is for us to for me to let young people know that that you have power, right? That we have power. We as individuals have power, that we as community have power. And we need to learn to exercise um, our power, right? Um, it's important that we live our lives unapologetic and unafraid but in order for us to be able to do that, we need to change the structures that have marginalized our peoples for centuries. And the only way that that is going to happen is when we organize, when we strategize, when we mobilize, and when, we're, when we radicalize the movements, right? We cannot live complacent and we cannot continue to be hypocrites about our place within our society and about the things that need to change. There is a shift that is happening in our communities and we are seeing it and many of us don't want to see it, but it's happening and it will happen. And I'm hoping that it will happen in my lifetime. And I'm hoping that I can be part of that change. 
things are crazy in the political realm. That's why it's important that any type of legislation that we, that it's going to be put forth, that we craft that, that we participate and that we influence in a way that we can in order for us to change those structures. And if we have to, I don't know, like shut it down, we need to shut it down, right? There's no time for complacency. Exercise your right to exist and exercise for you to, for all of us to live in a dignified world. So I will invite you to, to get together with your peoples, to get together with your community and to really figure out how we're going to make these changes happen. That, that, that's so well said and it's so important. And I think that, you know, voting is one thing and, and you know, it's important because you're not gonna get legislation through without people that you're voting for and putting them in that position. But it does seem on the, on the largest scale, you know, in an election like this, that the choices are not, not very ideal. But, you know, so, but it's also important for us to understand that, you know, that we need to hold people accountable those who make empty promises, yes. right? Just as we put them into office, we can get them out of office. So um, I am undocumented and I'm not able to vote, but I know that I can influence people, right? And it's, it's we can obviously, you know, we can shift the administration, but you know, there's different levels, right? Like we need to participate locally in our, you know, in our local elections and our, uh, anything that is happening locally, right? Like, you know, Mr. J is on the ballot in Los Angeles County. Um, you know, so we need to vote for that, those who have the ability to do that. You know, at the state level, right? Um, Prop 21, you know, we, um, you know, we need to have affordable uh, rent for people, right? Um, also Prop 16, right? It's, diverting, you know, the, um, it diverting the, uh, oh my God, I have it right here and I, I, it skipped, but it's, it's going to overturn, um, the oppression that has brought to Prop 209, which is, um, oh man, um, I, it just skipped my mind, but, um, but you know, a multiplicity of issues, right? Um, yes. That we can participate locally, state, and nationally, right? And that's just in politics. But as peoples, as resilient peoples who have existed for centuries, despite the fact that they've tried to erase our existence, we're still here and we're going to continue to be here. We just need to really focus and figure out how we're going to make our lives better. Well, and, and the protests and uprising that we're seeing are so essential too. And that is part of the system. I mean, that is guaranteed in the constitution. People are trying to, to shut it down and say that it's not right, but that is part of, of what America is. And you know, for all its incredibly flawed history, that's one of the good things. So, so the people who are reacting negatively and saying that this is somehow an attack on the system don't really seem to understand the basis of the constitution. Shut it down. Right? I mean, sometimes that is what has to happen. And, uh, you know, for, for, for people in marginalized communities, I, th I think it's so essential that that is the only way that their voices are going to be heard out there because the system is trying to shut it all out. I mean, you have two presidential candidates, neither of whom is supporting Medicare for all during a pandemic. And that affects trans people and people of color inordinately compared to the rest of the population. Yeah, that's why it got silent, because. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I so... <laughs> wasn't so... sure who said that. <laughs> it was background noise. <laughs> we like so, that. Uh, so I, I, I just wanted to, uh, to, to be mindful of the time and say it's about 7.10. And I wanted to um, uh, look at um, 
questions. There aren't any, uh, there's one question in the, in the Q&A right now, but I love where we started to go because we do have an election coming up in, uh, in less than three weeks, right? And, you know, this administration has been dubbed the administration of discrimination, right? And has tried to erode all of the advances, so many of the advances that were made for the trans community over, over the last four years, they've just systematically tried to break things down and break things down. So I'm glad, Bambi, thank you for, for mentioning some of the um, propositions and measures that are on the ballot that we can actually look towards to really support the trans community as we move forward. And you know, looking at who is gonna support the, tra the, the community a little bit more and more, right? Uh, the question I have right now in the uh, in the Q and A is about can um, can people uh, just give uh, one more time just with the organizations that you're with and uh, and the work that you're doing? Or actually, I can actually even yeah. go oh. to this uh, to, uh, to to Shasta who's answering uh, who's asking the question and um, and ask her if uh, they would like to ask this question themselves. Hold on a second. I'm going to go to them right now. Shasta, would you like to answer the, ask that question yourself? Yeah, um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm just sitting here just in awe of all of your work and your beauty. Um, like I said, I'm a CMHC uh, grad student at Antioch, New England, and I'm so appreciative of Antioch uh, LA putting this on. Um, and I'm wondering, since I'm very involved um, with uh, racial town halls that we have at my campus, um, if we can input the organizations that the panelists are involved in um, on my campus so that my campus can get involved with everybody here as well and support them with their um, initiatives. Cool. Thank you, Shasta. Uh, I think on the event page, there's a pretty detailed list. Is that correct, Cynthia? There absolutely yeah. is. Mm -hmm. so, so the page you use to register, that should have, you know, uh, detailed information about, about each panelist. I know it's really long because they've all done so much stuff and they're all so amazing. And, and, you know, I mean, I think that events like this with folks like you sharing your stories and, and the ways in which you've worked through the system are, are so vital. And, uh, you know, anything else that any of you wants to, to discuss or bring up, we'd, we'd love to hear. And if there's any further questions from people uh, watching the panel. I have a question. I have a question that goes back to resilience. So to really, when we're creating this, we really wanted to center resilience and strength. And, um, and it was really wonderful to hear that everybody, you know, on the panel has got, seems to have a pretty strong meditation practice in terms of centering themselves. And how about the, um, I want to hear a little bit about, one, about uh, resilience that you might have learned from your families. And Dexter, you said that you were uh, adopted, but, you know, adopted by someone, I, I'm guessing. You know, so the resilience that have come from your families or maybe your given families or and your chosen families as well. Sometimes we get a lot of our strength comes from our crew, our, our people, our community who's around us, you know, and how that has factored um, in your life and, and going through the work that you've done. And, and anybody can jump in and, and talk about that. Um, I think it's my mom. My mom and I are really close in, in a very weird way. And a lot of my family is very homophobic. So like our relationship is just very tight. And I think she gives me most of mine. She's also from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, she grew up like off, I'd say in a, basically the area that they're on was an old plantation. And the story she told me, I mean, my mom's like 80 now. So like, just do the math on like when she was in the, the you know, the, the South. So I think that um, hearing her stories and seeing how well adjusted she is after the shit that she's been through, kind of helps me push through the shit that I go through every day. I think, I think one for me um, is my kids. My kids are, are, are an interesting bunch. Um, so like when I started my transition, um, I think I was in maybe two years and I got ready to change my name and I was really excited about it. And I asked my son, I said, look, I want to make you a junior because I've wanted a junior my whole life, right? And so I said, um, can, can I make you a junior? Because, you know, I think he was like eight or 10 or something like that. And I was like, I'll give you an option, right? You're old enough to understand what's going on. And so um, I said, I want to make you a junior. He said, no, dad, get your own name. 
I said, oh, okay, well, this, this is happening. This eight-year-old just told me to go get my own name. But, you know, like, I like the way that my kids see the world because they see the world in a much different way. They see brighter colors. They see, they see things for what they are, not the facades that, that folks try to, try to mask themselves. And so there are times when even, you know, just recently within this uh, pandemic that I was just like, oh my God, like this is, this is, something's failing. Like I'm failing in this moment. And my four-year-old, she just turned four on Monday. My four-year-old, you know, she puts her, her hands on my face and she says, daddy, it's okay. And she doesn't, she doesn't know what's going on, but she knows that I'm, I'm feeling some kind of way. She knows that um, dad is not bubbly and, and gummy bearish, right? And so she, she just walked up to me and put both of her little hands on my face. And so when I look at the, the generations that are coming behind us, like the work that we're doing is going to impact them more than it will us. Like it, it may not be as immediate as we want it to be. It may not be that, that um, instant gratification that we're looking for. Like we want it fixed, not now, but right now. But I think knowing that the work that we're doing is going to better impact the next generations and that this is the reason we're doing this because we got to make sure they're okay, you know, and we have to make sure they are, are going to be um, in a much better situation than we are. Like I tell my kids all the time, I want y'all to be my upgrade. I want y'all to do better than, than I did. I want y'all to be better than I was. Um, and even with the mentorship program that we, that we have and with all of the other things that we do watching our community grow and thrive and, and step up and, and meet that moment, the next moment and the next moment and the next moment. And knowing that we had a hand in that um, is what keeps me, keeps me going. And I don't, I don't think it's a coincidence that your kids turned out to be so sensitive. <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably might've had something to do with you. How about you? Bit. How about you, Bambi? I mean, obviously, everything that I am and who I have become, I have learned from my family, uh, from my siblings, not just my blood relatives, but also my siblings in the movements, right? People who um, have uplifted me and believe in me for me to be where I am and, you know, create what I have been able to create. Um, and really, you know, like we have created collectively, right? Um, and so those are, you know, the things that obviously have supported me for me to continue to be resilient, right? And that's what I've learned from my ancestors, right? Um, I learned from other movements about what needs to happen in order to create those changes. So, you know, all of those, all of those are the pieces of the puzzle that, you know, have uplifted and built, you know, not just Bambi Salcedo, but also the Transatinal Coalition and, you know, everything that we do and who we are, and not just as the organization, but I myself as an individual. Um, it all comes from, you know, our family, my family, relatives, you know, um, whether they're chosen or just, you know, siblings in the struggle. Um, that's where I, you know, where I've gotten all my uh, strength and support. Um, but I also, I want to take this opportunity for, you know, to really express my immense gratitude to all the beautiful and amazing people who are just not joining us, but also for the invitation to share space and stage with this beautiful and amazing and beautiful uh, individuals. But I have to go. Um, it's... Um, as part of my self-care, I have been in my office since seven o'clock in the morning and I, you know, I need to take care of myself. So. And you've got a big day tomorrow too. <laughs> like this whole right. year has been full. So um, thank you everyone. I appreciate of you. Bambi Salcedo, thank you so much for yes. gracing us with your presence. You are a warrior sister and, and yes, you, you are. are well, you know, one of those whose shoulders we stand on. Thank you so much for being here and sharing yourself with us tonight. Thank you. Thank we'll see you. Soon, everybody. Take care. Have a good one. Congratulations on your award. Thank you. <laughs> Love you, Bambi.
Bye-bye. Uh, Love you too, honey. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye, Danny. Uh, so I do have another question here. And Great. it's from uh, Jane Moon. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm actually going to ask Jane if um, I can go ahead and unmute her or unmute them. And they can, because I'm sorry, I did not see uh, how you identified Jane. But uh, I'm going to go through and unmute you and uh, let you ask your question yourself, if I can find you here. Where are you, Jane? Oh, my goodness. So Jane's question was, and it's uh, because my, uh, it's so, there, got it, got it. I had you and it went away. So Jane's question was, how, it, how is it that people can show, um, show their support? Here, Jane, you are, you are unmuted now. You can go ahead. All right. Oh, hi. Oh, I just want to say, like, thank you so much. Um, this has just been such a, like, eye-opening, you know, panel just to listen to. Um, yeah, because I, I am cis. I also have, I don't have a lot of experience with, um, like not not a lot of like people in my community are like LG, are part of the LGBTQ community or you know it's just and so I'm always I'm sorry I'm I'm so nervous <laughs> um, but I just <laughs> I just wanted to ask like what's like the best way to show my support without it just being like performative activism you know because um, I'm always just afraid of like is this a way of crossing lines or like I yeah I, I, yeah sorry <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's a great question. Uh, I, I agree. Yeah, Lucky, do you have a um, an answer for that? Well, for me, um, I think that allies find a way to figure out like what the community is that they want to be allies for. Like, find out what they need. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Really talk to those communities. Really do your research. Find out um, like what's going on in those communities. Find out where the where the holes are, right? Find out where those mm -hmm. gaps are. Um, but also, definitely, I understand that that you can only Google so much, right? Especially when it comes to um, the trans community or the LGBTQ community, you can only Google so much reliable information. Um, I would tell you to reach out to you know community leaders or members of that community and really sit down and have a respectful conversation. Find out what their what their um, their pronouns are and, and really sit folks down and get to know people, get to know like what, what is, what, where are these, these gaps in these communities and what is it that they need, but also, right, um, talk to your friends that are, are outside of the community. So talk to all of your non-LGBT folks um, and really talk to them about being not only tolerant, but respectful of the LGBTQ community, okay? Like really show that, that show your friends how to show up, right? And really talk to your folks. And just like with, with all of the, 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 this unrest, the racial injustices, right? All of our, all of our, our white folks, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun and it's great to call all of your black folks and say, hey, are you okay? But yeah. it's even more valuable to talk to all of your white folks or non-black folks, right? And talk to them about how they're treating black folks. And really showing up in that kind of way because once you talk to them and then they talk to their folks and they talk to their folks now we have what would really gonna really start to affect change and really show people how to treat people because at the end of the day all we want is respect just respect our choices respect our path respect our lives because we're no different than any other human on this planet mm. oh, thank you <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, that, that, uh, I know we're running out of time. I just wanted to give Dom a chance because you didn't get to talk about uh, who in your family or your background. And, and of course the others had mentioned that family is not always just your biological family. How about for you? I found that I get a lot of resilience from using my platform with my agency. They gave me like a model talk series that I talked with other people in the marginalized community. And I give people a, a a face with what the issues are going on with. So I like to thank my agency for that. And I also get a lot of resilience from the younger generation coming out and the hunger that they have to 
listen, to learn, to be proactive. And to, those are the people that will make the change when we're not here. So I like the momentum that my agency gets from the, ha letting me have their platform. And I have like a model talk every two weeks and I speak to different people and we talk about different issues. And um, to answer Jane's question, I feel like you just have to put um, marginalized people on the highest pedestal as possible, if that's mm -hmm. what you want to support. If you know, if you have a, a gay person, black, LGBT person, you know, treat them better than you would treat anybody else, even better than yourself. So that you can be an example of what you what people should do instead of like, you know, posting or anything or, or calling any friends. That's what I tell a lot of people is that just put everybody that's marginalized in the highest platform as possible. And you know, of course they're gonna fall, but the higher you put them, the less they'll fall. And it'll give a domino effect for people to see how to treat us as a marginalized community. So that's the best advice that I can give to people. And I've been giving for to support because, you know, people want to do performative activism, like I said, and it doesn't really help. Like the posts don't really help. And also like, like he said, education, you know, if you don't know about something, educate yourself before you go and speak to it about other people, to other people. Education is key, get contact someone in the community and learn about their story, learn about their struggles and then pass that on to your non-marginalized friends or family members. And it starts at home, you know, start take it, it starts at home and you can make the ripple get bigger. What a great answer. And I think that's gonna take us out because I think we're out of time. Cynthia, you wanna sign off for everyone? I just wanna thank the panelists. What, what a great group you are. And, and you know, I learned a lot of things and I'm sure the people participating via Zoom learned a lot too. And thank you so much for being here. And we'd love to have you back again in the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, uh, for, for being here with us. We did, we did have one question left and, and uh, from Connor that was about you know, advice that we would have to, to young people. But I think that part of what Dominique said, what Dom said, and what uh, Lucky said as well, are kind of a, the, the, the path that we can start into and, and having that conversation. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to, to all of our audience members who came through. I think Jane, one of the first steps is this, finding ways to come and be a part of something like this and to hear, you know, to hear what people are saying and to learn and to understand is Dr. Jackson started us off with the whole idea of listening with your, your eyes and your ears and your whole heart and bringing yourself all the way into the conversation and, and listening to understand that is the, the step that you start to do to, uh, to, to get to bridge, to make a bridge happen. So thank you all, each of you, Dom, thank you, Dexter, thank you, Lucky, thank you, Jesse, for being our facilitator. Thank you, Dr. Jackson and uh, the LGBT spec for, for being a part of co-creating -cre co uh, this evening. Um, there will be more, so keep on looking for us. We'll be doing this once a quarter, um, having a conversation with, uh, with Jesse. So um, we haven't decided what our next conversation is going to be just yet but there will be a new one and uh, we definitely look forward to, to hearing from the three of you and from Bambi as well in the future please look them up online go back to the to the website see all of the wonderful things that that people are doing and find out how you can find them and support the work that they're doing so thank you so so much thank and you uh, absolutely and good night everybody good night, good night. thanks for being here Absolutely. Thank you.